Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lunch with Friends and Strangers. I'm Max Orr, your host for today's biography program. Uh, this is, of course, brought to you by Carolina Public Humanities. And this is our funnest project we do, where we get to uh, talk with excellent faculty and scholars from uh, uh, Charles Lehman has raised his hand. Charlie, is there something we can do for you? <laughs> uh, put it in the chat. Hopefully, you're, everyone can hear us. I hope that everyone uh, is uh, able to hear us out there. Um, and assuming that you are, I do want to welcome you all again to today's event. Uh, remind you folks that uh, these are uh, wonderful sort of informal conversations with faculty about really interesting people. Sometimes people you've already uh, met or, or have heard of, sometimes people you've never heard of, but in any case, we learn much more about them. I do want to remind folks we have one more of these events coming up on April 9th, uh, and this will be with Philip Gura and William Apes. Uh, a really fascinating Native American from the 17th century, uh, and, no, excuse me, 18th century uh, in, uh, in uh, the Massachusetts area, we'll be uh, learning about William Apes. And also, I do want to remind you folks about the Adam Symposium coming up on April 16th and 17th. We'll be bringing down uh, Professor Elizabeth Anderson, a philosopher from the University of Michigan, to give the keynote talk on Friday night, which will be on the um, which will be on uh, uh, the work ethic in the 21st century and its applicability to today's society. Uh, and the following morning, of course, we have the symposium in which uh, Professor Anderson will respond to uh, UNC faculty and graduate students who will, will give um, their opinion about uh, what she had to say. Um, so please come up. That's free and open to the public. Uh, it is, of course, virtual, like everything we do these days. Uh, we're hopefully 3D is coming up soon enough, folks. Um, a few things before I begin, uh, begin and introduce our uh, speaker or guest today, I wanted to uh, thank our uh, sponsors, the Cotton Market Group at Morgan Stanley, Carolina Meadows. Uh, we also want to thank the North Carolina Honor Society for all their great help they've given us for the K-12 programs. Uh, and of course, our partner in a lot of our programming and promoting uh, of our programs, the General Alumni Association. Also want to thank Paul Bonici behind the scenes, always doing fantastic work. Uh, without, oh, and one other thing I want to thank people for, I want to thank everyone, uh, maybe some folks here on our participant list today, um, had given to uh, Carolina Public Humanities yesterday at Give UNC, and we hit our goal, uh, unlocking a $25,000 matching gift. So thank you to everyone who was able to give to uh, CPH uh, yesterday, uh, and of course, we appreciate your support. It helps us keep doing what we do. Without further ado, let us please bring in our guest. Um, and that is Dr. Heidi Kim, Professor of English and Comparative Literatures. Um, welcome. Dr. Heidi Kim, also Director of the Asian American Center at UNCCH. And uh, I want to just start, uh, welcome, first of all, hello. Can you unmute your microphone? Yes. There you are. Okay, great. Well, thank you for, thank you for bringing our, well, we'll introduce our stranger in a moment. Thank you for bringing our stranger on. Um, Heidi, if it's not too, um, you know, to uh, stark a beginning, I want to just talk to you a little bit about um, Asian American life in the United States today, uh, in the wake of what we've seen over the past year, and certainly what we saw in Atlanta. Um, what are you doing at the Asian American Center and uh, to address uh, Asian American uh, hate, you know, hate in Asia for Asian Americans or the, the prejudice that we're seeing, discrimination, and, and just some thoughts about where we are as a country in terms of Asian Americans? and Pacific Islanders? We had a lot of direct action through the Asian American Center. So even before the Atlanta shootings, as you know, there's been a rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans for the past year. So um, I think very early in March, uh, we had had a student-led open forum just where community members and allies could come together to discuss, to process, um, and I had issued a letter to the community um, discussing not only feelings, but offering some of the historical background and sending out some different resources that people could use. After the Atlanta shootings happened, uh, we co-hosted a community vigil online with North Carolina Asian Americans together, which was really well attended. It was very moving actually to see how many people who were not Asian American came um, and, and really were there in solidarity. So those were just a few of our direct actions. Again, we've been putting out resources, you know, holding more programming. We have an anti-racism workshop tonight. 
Um, and so there's, there's a lot that I feel we can do directly. The center's whole larger educational mission, of course, is aimed at trying to break down these walls of prejudice and misunderstanding of each other uh, that keep us all apart. But I would say it's it's been challenging on on the center side. You know, we're we're kind of um, inundated, frankly, with requests for help or consultation or information or speaking engagements or partnerships, um, which is wonderful. And I do as much of that as I can. Um, but you know, on the flip side, we have a lot of community members who are just very afraid. Um, you know, there is another really uh, frightening attack caught on video yesterday in New York yeah. that has more. You know, it's it's just a, a continued feeling of of being unsettled and and feeling um, uncertain about going out in public even and and I feel it too personally you know I I try you know we're all sitting at the computer all day now every day and um, I really try to get out for a walk when I can and I just I have thoughts now when I go for that walk that you know I just wouldn't Mom's have had a year ago I'm so sorry to, to, to hear that. I also want to, you know, just feel for all of my uh, colleagues of color, faculty of color, that when this is, when things happen in these communities, we put a real burden on our faculty to be the spokespeople. And so thank you for doing that. But it is a burden as well, right? You, you know, always constantly come and talk to us. And I just wish people would educate themselves as well. So uh, hopefully we can start that process as well. So, you know, not put the burden on having to please always explain to us what is going on in communities and in, in, of, of our fellow Americans uh, that we can educate ourselves to. And maybe we can do that today with looking at the insights of our guest, uh, our, our, our special stranger. Should we introduce our stranger and see what kind of uh, insights we can get into uh, Asian American life? Absolutely. All right, great. Well, we have a fascinating person um, and uh, we're just gonna sort of start with a, um, start with a general uh, appraisal. Our guest is none other than uh, Jade Snow Wong. And um, I wanna be able to see myself so I can see you. There we go. Uh, and uh, tell, give us the overview. Who is Jade Snow Wong and why should we be uh, paying attention to her? So Jade Snow Wong was most famous for being an author, a memoirist, and also a nonfiction writer. Um, and a ceramic artist. So her fame chiefly came in the late 40s and 1950s. And she really served as this kind of exemplar of a new Chinese American community because there just previously had not been any understanding of people of Chinese descent as American, really. Mm -hmm. So um, she was seen as kind of a, a leader for that shift. And of course, there's increased political attention to China in this era. And so she also very much was positioned as this bridge between cultures. Um, and she was sent on State Department tours to demonstrate how equitable and non racist the United States was. So she went on these goodwill tours around uh, Southeastern Asia as part of the State Department's anti-communism efforts. So she really just played this incredibly difficult and uh, crucial public role. So, and that of course was you know, compounded by um, her artistry and her um, American education and also the way that as a woman, you know, she could be positioned as beautiful and non-threatening. So let's, I mean, we'll, we're gonna go back and review some of the family history, but this is the text that, that we're talking about here, the fifth Chinese daughter. What, what inspired, I mean, again, we'll go back and look at the early life, what is depicted in this book, but what inspired the writing of this book and, and, you know, and when it came out and what kind of reception did it get? I mean, obviously we're looking at several editions right here. So it was a popular book. Um, tell yeah, us that orange one in the middle, that's the one I grew up with. Okay. Um, and then the one on the right uh, is a, a new academic edition that just came out. Um, yeah, she had dabbled in writing a little bit, 
Um, she'd published a couple of shorter, more humorous pieces about her family and Chinese American life. And actually it was a very famous and powerful New York editor who reached out to her and encouraged her to write this book, which otherwise she said herself, she would not even have thought of doing for many years. So this editor, Elizabeth Lawrence was a kind of noted editor of um, women's writing and ethnic women's writing. So I think the most famous book that she edited was probably A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Oh sure. If you know that. Oh sure. Um, yeah, so you know, she was really um, one of the diversifiers of literature at that time. And she really helped and shaped uh, this memoir a lot in ways that scholars have also been really interested in. Do you get the sense that she was responding to some of the zeitgeist in, in wanting to sh shine a light on Chinese Americans because of some of the political circumstances that you had talked about, um, that this was a point in time where we need to understand Chinese Americans? Yeah, absolutely. She was she was part of that um, circle in, in New York who were really interested, you know, because um, back then, especially the just the the cultures were, you know, much more intertwined. And so um, you had like literary editors who were very involved in political movements and, and so on. Um, and she was really invested in a lot of these types of issues. So let's get to this. I mean, the story that she was asked to tell was the story. It's a it's an autobiographical account. It's pretty accurate. The... Ah, <laughs> this is this is a really interesting point. So I actually just did a whole bunch of research on this, um, and and the book just came out, um, and I had the opportunity to go through her archives, which are newly deposited at the Library of Congress, and. No, it's not that accurate. There, there are some really deliberate deceptions in there, some excisions um, and some complete reconstructions. Also, if you look at the drafts, um, she really watered down in the final version, a lot of her resentment of her family because in many ways she had a very difficult childhood. And some of that didn't even come out until 2000 and, and later, really at the very end of her life when she was still writing. Yeah. And that hasn't been published uh, except for these snippets in my new book, but it was really astonishing to see her reveal some of that family history for the first time decades later. I mean, that really is something about autobiography that we need to pay attention to. It's, it's, it's got so many layers upon which the distance between what is being told has to go through the filter of one's own personal feelings and then what they feel comfortable putting out in front of people, you know, and just, and, and the responsibility that you have that you're, did she get a sense when she was writing this book, a sense of responsibility for the community that her story would be portrayed as somehow uh, emblematic of Chinese American communities or was it very much just a personal story? No, she really felt that weight. I think um, when she was younger, she felt it more in the sense of speaking for her family. Um, but as she grew older, and I think during the writing of this book, she was really thinking about representing Chinese America in a certain and very positive way. And um, throughout the 1950s, I really see that in her writing. So um, she actually wrote a book review of the novel Flower Drum Song. So some people might be familiar with the musical um, Flower Drum Song, which, yeah, which I talked about at happy hour. Um, but there was a novel Flower Drum Song and she reviewed it and she did not like it because you know, the young man in it, he has premarital sex and he's kind of aimless in life and, you know, um, doesn't have a good relationship with his family. And she just disapproved of this from top to bottom. She thought it was such a terrible portrayal of the community and really didn't accurately represent Chinese values. So you have that same kind of infighting in the community over what's authentic, right? And what's mm -hmm. really representative. And this responsibility of the sense that, you know, here's a community that faces discrimination and this is a community that faces, you know, in the height of McCarthyism and the height of all of, you know, the Red Scare that there's you, you there is a responsibility to portray the community a certain way. Is that fair to say that Jade 
Snow Wong was thinking when she's reviewing this, when she's writing her 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 books. That's very interesting. Yeah. Let's yeah, I think so. And, you know, she really she really took that on from what we would later call a model minority kind of angle. So mm -hmm. she didn't talk about racism in her books until much later in her life. She didn't um, discuss the really specific housing discrimination that she and her husband mm -hmm. faced when they were a young couple looking for a place to live. Um, none of that really came out until a much later era. So in the early Cold War, she was really just concerned with presenting herself, her family, her community in the most positive light imaginable. Well, let's get to some of the reality behind the sort of image. She painted an image, but there is a reality. She does have an, a family, a Chinese American family, a, a, an American family uh, born in San Francisco. This is, uh, this is, uh, a picture. What are we? What are we looking at here? This is uh, where is where is she and who are we looking at? So she's right in the middle, um, next to the central trolley pole. This is a okay. San Francisco trolley, and uh, those are her brothers and sisters. Her father is on the left. Mm -hmm. Her mother is not pictured because she didn't really leave the house. Um, so those are her brothers and sisters, but this already. Um, is the start of a portrayal that she would continue, which is this big, happy, united family. And what is not shown in here and what she actually in her public life kind of hid is that her father was married twice. And so she had two older half sisters and she had a terrible relationship with them. Was that from a childhood on? Was that a widower situation or a divorce situation? Or... widower um okay. her father was widowed and then he married her mother but what i and other scholars um have worked on and what her papers really confirmed is that her her mother her father's second wife entered the u.s fraudulently mm -hmm. so she entered as somebody else's wife um and then she you know uh, it was a picture bride arrangement. So then she she married Jade Snow Wong's father um, and had all these children and had a very difficult, you know, working class life uh, in San Francisco Chinatown. But it was really, uh, it was not something that she talked about. And she very carefully kind of mushes the two wives together in her memoirs and her public interviews throughout most of her life because she was hiding that immigration status. So her, her mother uh, her mother immigrated. Now, of course, not to put too fine a point on it, but US immigration law was incredibly racist and particularly against Asian American Asians. Uh, so um, was that was the fraudulence in response to the, the immigration law? Do we have any sense of the reasoning? Yes. Yeah, that's why it was incredibly difficult um, early in the in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was incredibly difficult for women in particular to immigrate mm -hmm. because of the effort to make sure that Chinese in the US would only ever be a transient labor force. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, the kind of more racist or uh, white purist, white supremacist mm -hmm. political forces were trying to really restrict the immigration and they thought that if only men came yeah. then they wouldn't settle down they wouldn't have children and uh, the population size could be controlled yeah. this is a classic you know immigration what we wanted were workers what we got were people right <laughs> exactly exactly yeah uh, so to, you know and, and just a just a little bit of a backstory about um uh, did her, was her father born in the United States or immigrated uh, from China? Do you have a sense of the history on the father's side? Yes, he immigrated uh, and he immigrated in ways that I think are, there are possibly some questions about that as well. Um, but he eventually uh, was able to come because he got a professional status visa, essentially. That's the easiest way of explaining it because at a certain point, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, as it's known, really restricted the flow even of uh, hard laborers. So 
it was much easier to come if you had that professional status, what they called merchant class. So he was able to immigrate in that way uh, as I think an accountant for a small business. And during most of Jade Snow Wong's childhood, he was running an overalls factory. Okay. So they describe, she, she describes how they had just blue, blue denim fluff around their noses all the time. Wow. Because they, they were just surrounded by cut denim. W would you describe, um, you know, class is, of course, very interesting when you think about, you know, American, you know, like uh, normative white class structures, and then there are class structures within immigrant communities. How, how was that? How did she think of herself in terms of class, the way that she was raised, both thinking, you know, in the broader sense of the United States, but in the community that she was raised? Was she raised in Chinatown? She was, okay. she was. Yeah, I think here, here I'm gonna have to step back and just piece it together for you from all yeah. of her writings because sure. she talked about it so differently at different points in her life. And I would say she saw herself as kind of middle because middle of the Chinatown community because you know her father owned a factory. When I say factory, we're not talking big glamorous fac factory, right? We're talking like several workers in a basement. Yeah. Um, including her mother and herself, right? So really kind of a family business. Yeah. Um, and you don't get the denim in your nose if you're not down in the, down and we're yeah. doing the work, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, she knew that she wasn't one of the itinerant workers mm -hmm. who was always looking for work. But at the same time, later in her life, she wrote about her husband's family and how his mother was much more pampered, right? Didn't have to work nearly as hard as her mother who just seems to have worked her fingers to the bone constantly. Um, so I think she recognized that there were, you know, not only different family structures or family ways of treating people, but also just different levels of economic comfort in Chinatown. Well, we know that she was obviously educated and literary and so how, how did education work and you know was she did she take the schooling right away was uh her was were her family very supportive of education um you know clearly not in the factory when at school right so how, how did education play into her life and she, she seemed to have taken to it pretty well they were extremely supportive of the kids education but for the girls only up to a point so she had a lot of resentment about the fact that she had to work her way through college, whereas her brothers were sent to college mm -hmm. by the family. Um, and so she worked her way through two years of junior college, and then she got a scholarship to Mills College, which was, you know, it's a small private women's college. Mm -hmm. um, and she had a real feeling of achievement and her parents were evidently extremely proud of her when she graduated. But like I said, at the same time, she really resented that she had had to work her way through. And she writes about that in her autobiography in a way that kind of confirms Chinese stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, they only value the boys and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, then later in her life, she looks at other families and she's like, well, but you know, they did it totally differently. So um, it's it's interesting to see even that perspective evolve. So she's born in 1922. Does she graduate? When does she graduate from Mills College? Do you have a sense? She graduated in Mills College around um, 42, I think. Okay. So, yeah. Around 20 years old 42, or so. so 43. Well, this is a, I, we have a really great picture here that you supplied us. This is, um, I think I, it sounds like before going to college, but certainly already um, highly uh, literary. Uh, tell us about this picture. You were, we we're talking a little bit in the, uh, when we were preparing today, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so I'm sorry for the glare on this. Um, this is just a photo I took of a photo in the Library of Congress collection. And when she was about 17 or 18, um, she won a, an essay contest, uh, maybe a little bit older, actually. I think it was wartime already, um, so World War II. And she won an essay contest um, about citizenship um, and, you know, like sort of the rights and responsibilities. 
And as a prize, she got to christen a ship. So this is really her first big public event. And as you see, whether by choice or by guidance, she and her sister went in full Chinese gear. And if I remember correctly, I think Madame Chiang Kai-shek was actually a guest at that because she was touring the US to kind of gain goodwill for China, which was of course an ally during mm -hmm. World War II. Um, so there's, there's Jade Snow Wong in the forefront and the glare is over her sister's face. Really uh, and I think she's holding the bottle that she's about to yeah. smash on the ship. I guess I never realized they put a protective cloth around the bottle. It does make sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I always imagine, you know, uh, that's, you know, and I do think that, I think it's really interesting, the choice of the clothing and, you know, in an essay on citizenship is to, is this a sort of an embracing of multiculturalism sort of underneath the, you know, underneath the, uh, the text, if you will, I'm coming to talk to you about citizenship and citizenship is multicultural. I mean, is that, uh, maybe so I'm stretching here. <laughs> Yeah, it's so hard to say because also, you know, she's young in this picture, but even by the time she graduated college when she was, you know, still only like 20, she was very cynical about putting her Chineseness to public use, right? Mm -hmm. She was contemplating starting her ceramics business. And she actually wrote to a friend this astonishing line that I quoted in my book. And she said, well, I will play up the Chinese angle so as not to have any competition from you know these other like department stores in San Francisco and i just remember i have it in my notes you know when i was in the library of congress and i just noted down wow the cynicism yeah right that she already understood that she could just use this exotic identity in order to gain some kind of economic advantage or some kind of attention um and she had no hesitation about using it. You know, even her name, right? Nobody in her personal life called her Jade Snow. Nobody. Uh, Con Connie? Is it, what, did, what was she yeah. called? Yeah. Her English name was Constance. So mm -hmm. all of her, all of her um, English speaking friends called her Con Connie or Con. Mm -hmm. And then um, her her Chinese speaking friends and family would have just called her by her, her Chinese name, but nobody ever called her Jade Snow, which is the transliteration of the Chinese characters that mm -hmm. make up her name. That was just so, something she made up for public consumption. It's really interesting too, you know, in the sense that you, the cynicism of I'm going to play up, play to the exoticism, right? I'm going to play this up. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's, you, you, you also, you know, what I would like to see is the pride of culture. Like I want to show this culture. So that does give us a sense of sort of the, the liminal space that she sort of is in, because this is, again, now we would want to say, well, I'm going to show you what, you know, this culture that I'm so proud of, right? And then I can yeah. play this up. So is that, so that really is a sort of a conflict uh, within Jade uh, Snow Wong. And uh, is that, I guess, typical for Chinese Americans in the 1950s? Was this related to politics or just the general sort of, not to put too fine a point on, reaction to the racism, normative racism in America? I think, especially for a new community, it's it's always such a double bind, right? We, we have some not so nice names for it now, like native informancy, right? If you're, if you're it's almost like betraying your culture in a way or selling your culture. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there was this real desire to show it to people to kind of um, bring the communities closer together. And she did a lot of that work. You know, this was the era where also there was starting to be more interest in Asian food. Mm -hmm. And she did that. She wrote articles on food, she wrote articles on Chinatown restaurants. She arranged some kind of um, high profile Chinatown dinner for the wives of diplomats who were at a San Francisco conference. Um, so I think, you know, the, the wives of pretty much all the famous figures from that era. And uh, so that was something that was a part of the United States recognizing Chinese Americans as part of the culture right, as, as a population that was here, that was vibrant and had a lot 
that we should value. So there's, it's, it's never an easy position. I mean, I, I still feel it. I can, I can empathize, even though mm -hmm. Asian American population is so much bigger and, you know, more well-established today, but, but of course there's always that tension. You know, uh, we were kind of jumping around in times or whatnot. I do want to go back to this earlier because you provided this very compelling document and uh, sort of speaks to the idea of identity here. Um, this is from obviously from you know, look at the date on this. We're talking December of 1941. Go ahead, Heidi. What are we looking at here? This is author's ID proving U.S. citizenship and Chinese ancestry during anti-Japanese hysteria. So this really speaks to, I think, her father's understanding of the political climate and also just reminds us of how bad um, the anti-Japanese sentiment was after Pearl Harbor, which of course, as we know, and I do a lot of scholarly work on, put 120,000 Japanese Americans in camps, um, most of them citizens and the rest not allowed to naturalize by the laws of the time. So um, this comes from her last manuscript that she was writing later in her life. And she looked back and she said she'd forgotten about this, but that her father took all of them out to get these affidavits so that they could prove that they weren't Japanese because that's how bad things were at that yeah. time. I imagine that, you know, considering that we already see in, in American racism, the just sort of flattening of difference for Asian Americans, uh, were Chinese Americans targeted um, during this era for people that just kind of said Asian and just sort of all Asians are suspect or any sense of that? I, I, we think, of course, about the great injustice done to Japanese Americans, but I'm curious about other Asian Americans during this time, whether they felt any pressures. I mean, obviously, there's a pressure here to go and get this card made, but you know, in general. So from the immediate public reaction, yes, there was a lot of conflation, you know, much as there is now, right, yeah. where anybody who looked like they might be Japanese would be targeted. There was also a real concerted government and media effort to educate the public about that distinction, because again, China was an ally. And so um, there are propaganda posters throughout the war about like, you know, China, basically the good guys, right? Okay. There are staunch allies. Um, very famously, Time and Life magazine had features um, and, you know, excuse the pejorative, but how to tell your friends from the Japs, right? That's a very infamous title. I was, I was going to ask, but it's almost, I'm almost embarrassed to ask if they had charts saying like this, yeah, you know, your Asian yeah. types, you know? They had photos, side-by-side -side photos and kind of pointing out differences in facial features as if it's really, you know, that easy anyway for bystander to learn that. Um, and they described one Chinese American reporter, a, I think a DC or New York reporter who was just going around with a big button on, on his coat saying, I am a Chinese American. So um, it, was, it was certainly a difficult um, and perilous time. And you can see um, how quickly Jade Snow Wong's father acted, but he was familiar with this. You know, he had had to get all kinds of affidavits for his own immigration and migration before. So I think he was very savvy about that. When the Red Scare comes after 1949, we have the People's Republic of China. Was there a, an uptick in suspicion that, that Jade Snow Wong would notice? I mean, we've already sort of covered this in general, but I'm just curious if that general discourse of know your, know your quote unquote friendly Asians from threats, whether that language changed at all to suspicion of Chinese Americans. She records nothing about this. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that publicly, yes, there was a lot of suspicion. Um, there were a lot of government policies that cracked down on immigration because of this fear of communist infiltration. Um, every entering Chinese American or Chinese person was seen as a potential threat. So we definitely see that layer in that historical era. At the same time, again, you have this big wave of counter-programming, right? Yeah. So um, there, there's a wave of memoirs from refugees and many of them very elite 
refugees from communist China. So uh, in, I think, circles that were really interested in these issues, people did have an understanding of that distinction and kind of a sympathetic feeling towards refugees. Mm-hmm. But in, in the larger picture, and again, looking at policy, um, there, was, there was this real Cold War chill. Yeah. Well, I, we, we've talked a lot about her literary origins, her contributions with the book. But of course, when you look up Jade Snow Wong, she's also known you know, as, a, as an artist. Um, wh- where does this start? How, does this, how, how quickly does she get notoriety? Um, talk to us a little bit about her art, about this. I mean, these are beautiful bowls here. Yeah. Um, and by the way, they are expensive <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> I actually have one. I have, yeah, please. this isn't a ceramic one. This is a metalwork plate. I think those two color photos are also metalwork plates. Okay. And I got this on eBay several years ago when eBay was kind of like the hot thing. And, you know, it was expensive for me at that time, but I, it, it was, you know, that's why I have a small plate. <laughs> it was what I could afford. Um, Yeah, this is such an argument for a liberal arts education because she had to take an art class at Mills College Mm -hmm. and she ended up taking a ceramics class and she loved it. And she obviously had a huge flair for it. And she decided to open her own little tiny pottery business in Chinatown. And her pieces got extremely well known and they made their way to the collections of MoMA and I think also the Metropolitan Museum. Um, I don't think they're currently on display. So uh, in her time, this happened shortly? Yeah, after this happened, you know, when she was still very young. So like 1949, even before the book came out, she was this up and coming young artist and she was featured in various San Francisco and even national magazines. So mm-hmm. um, she was really on the rise. Uh, although I think you can see this is an early photo. She's not as glammed up as she is in some of her later photos mm-hmm. where you know, kind of after the magazines got their hands on her, yeah. her, her well, hair got really slicked back and everything. Well, it's um, messy work, you know, it's like, look, yeah. look at her hands. I mean, it's, this is a uh, serious work and it, you, you don't want to be too fancy or else you're wasting your time because you're going to get splattered with stuff and, and whatnot. Yeah. I'm curious it about... Was- we we certainly know um you know china itself as being just you know the the home and the origins of some of the greatest ceramic work in the world you know and and did she see her own artwork uh, in any sense of a tradition i mean i to i look at these bowls and i and i don't necessarily see sort of a chinese uh, imprint on them but i'm also incredibly ignorant so mm-hmm. where does where does um what does her pottery fit in with some sense of identity if at all so that's the interesting thing about the I will play up the Chinese angle yeah. remark that she made because again, like she learned her pottery at Mills College, right? Like there wasn't any sort of traditional craftsmanship that she had steeped herself in. You know, she never had any formal education in Chinese fine arts, except for, you know, her father and her school teaching her to write. And so um she just really kind of forged her own way. And I think she did adopt some techniques, right? She, she learned some glazing techniques that mm-hmm. gave them a more Chinese look. Um, same thing when she got to the metal work, I think she uh, often went for a lot of bright reds and mm-hmm. you know colors that were really identified um, with Chinese artwork. But the training, you know, it wasn't really, it, it, it wasn't really as strongly part of the Chinese tradition. Um, And so she started her business in Chinatown, partly because that's what she could afford, but again, also to play up that Chinese angle because this is also the era and it's reflected again in the flower drum song when Chinatown is opening up as a kind of tourist destination, right? There are nightclubs opening up, um, you know, restaurants, and so she was part of that wave. She was part of that wave of, of opening up Chinatown as this Mecca. And, and so clients or customers could be Chinese Americans buying products, but also people coming into Chinatown, seeing this pottery shop and buying the pottery as well. So 
Chiefly, right. chiefly people coming really? in to Chinatown. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, you know, I was looking at some, just doing some background research on this, and I and I have, I want to be uh, honest with you, I didn't have time to read it all, but I came across something you wrote about her and the Budapest uh, uh, musicians, and yeah. just it was, and, and I and again, I apologize for having just kind of quickly skimmed through, but it sense I got the sense that this was a moment for sort of a broadening of perspective for her on the world and her and and the place. What what was the import of this interchange with these musicians in the nineteen fifties? Yes. So again, value of a liberal arts college. Mm -hmm. The way that she worked herself through Mills was by um, she was essentially the housekeeper for the dean. Mm -hmm. And the dean said to her, like, I want you to embrace a liberal arts education. You should really go to some concerts or something. And she kind of hemmed and hawed. And the dean said, I'll buy you the tickets and you just water my plants or something in exchange. So she started going and she just fell in love with it. She had had no real exposure to Western classical music, but she just loved it. And so this always struck a chord with me because I grew up with a lot of classical music. I love it as well. And she talks about this string quartet a lot in Fifth Chinese Daughter who came over to Dean's house for dinner and she cooks them a traditional Chinese dinner. Um, and it's, it's quite a funny kind of um, cross-cultural, multicultural interaction because she describes you know, the Russian members of the string quartet. And so you can kind of identify them and it's confirmed in her archive as uh, the members of the Budapest String Quartet, which was you know, one of the most famous and celebrated string quartets of that time, um, still legendary. But what I didn't know until I looked at her letters was that they had this kind of lasting friendship. And so like every time they were in town for a concert, they would all get together, right? And I think a couple of times she was in another city where they had a concert, they would all get together, they would toast whoever wasn't there. Um, and it just was this lovely kind of um, relationship, you know, it wasn't extremely personally close, uh, but she just had that same kind of fandom, uh, that, that same kind of admiration and, and affection for them that anyone else might feel for their favorite artist. That's quite cute to see. Yeah, it's, I'm gonna go back and read it in detail. I saw that was the Budapest, that they were in fact these famous musicians, very interesting. I mean, you know, we could go on for hours talking about all kinds of sidebars. I'm curious about, you know, Budapest in the 1950s, of course, you know, <laughs> there's, there's, that's a whole other international conversation we'll put on this, put off to the side. You know, there's a second book, No Chinese Stranger, which I believe came out in the 1970s. But before I get to that, just, you know, we have this book in the early 50s. Um, what about the 50s and 60s? Is this just continuing uh, literary? Is there more literary output? Um, the ceramics? Uh, is she maintaining a level of notoriety throughout the 50s and 60s? And if so, how? She was doing a lot during the 50s and 60s. She, um, she had her children. She was building up her pottery and metalwork business. She tried to maintain her writing career mostly by magazine articles at that point because this was also the heyday of really big magazines and so they paid well. Mm -hmm. um, and she also at some considerable personal sacrifice went on these goodwill tours to the State Department. So she stayed quite busy. And at the same time, uh, her husband was building up a travel agency. Mm -hmm. And later in her life, um, she took a more active role in that. And then after his death, she actually took it over. She stopped her ceramics and metalwork altogether. So, so quite, a, quite a varied career. Yeah, I don't want to skip over getting married and having children. Um, do, dates on this and what type of uh, relationship or um, where did she meet her husband and any any information on the on that? Yeah, he was another Chinatown boy. Um, he's actually featured in Fifth Chinese Daughter, although he made her use a different name for him. And they had a very close and loving and supportive relationship by when when did by they all marry? evidence. They married, I think around around the time the book came out. Okay. Because the post book publicity talks about her as a newlywed. 
And so I think around 1950. And how many children did uh, they have? Oh, I feel sure. bad that I'm not sure of this, but I think That's two okay. boys. Okay. Two boys. I've worked with one of her sons for the various permissions and so on. Great. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 I assume or hope that the family is pretty proud of their illustrious, uh, their illustrious matron, if you will. I think so. And, you know, it was it was they who gave the papers to the Library of Congress. And so I think they recognize that she has this really important historical place. Um, Maxine Hong Kingston, who's a much more famous, I think, publicly famous writer, um, she referred to her as the mother of Chinese American literature. And I think that, you know, she really holds that place in literary history, but mm -hmm. also just as a historical figure, she's really fascinating. And yeah. you can compare her to a lot of other Asian Americans in the Cold War who found themselves in a similar position. Well, she certainly is fascinating. We're gonna, we're gonna, I wanna remind folks, we have time for questions at the bottom of the screen here. So please put in any questions you have about uh, Jade Snow Wong or about any of the topics we're putting up. I, there is the second book and I would just say the second book I don't think is, is quite as popular only because I really couldn't find pictures of it. <laughs> uh, you know, I found this one here. Tell me about, this was, a, this was related to her travels. Is that right? This, this text came out in yes. the 70s? Yes, largely this is about her State Department travels. Um, but I actually, delved into it for my my book because I was really interested to see the little bit that she opened up about her family uh, in ways that she hadn't in 1950. Because of course in the 70s, you know, we're pretty much getting to the prime time of the Asian American movement, right? Mm -hmm. Politically and culturally. And so she's just much more open about immigration difficulties and restrictions, although she doesn't talk about her mother but she at mm -hmm. least talks about the issue. And then she's also much more open about racism. So that's the book where she talks about how she and her husband couldn't find a place to live until a white friend came along with them to look at places and how, um, you know, they were, uh, they had to rent in this area at where, you know, these people, like one time a, a drunk man came and banged on their door in the middle of the night um, demanding, you know, basically asking where the girls were, right? So as yeah, if, yeah. you know, um, kind of putting us in mind of the Atlanta shootings, just this identification of yeah. Asian American women with sex work. Um, and so she, you know, her husband apparently went out and beat him up. And then she, she came out the next morning and found her husband calmly hosing the blood off of the steps. Oh, and man. you can just see her as a writer kind of digesting this, yeah, you know, right. um, that she didn't quite know how she felt about it. Uh, but she's much more willing to speak about it in 75 than she is in 1950. Well, we do want to we want to wrap up here pretty soon to allow some time for questions and whatnot. I do want to, you know, show a, a, a photo of of her later in life. Um, it, later in life, as uh, quote unquote, sitting on laurels or continuing output throughout, throughout, um, not sitting. I mean, everybody deserves a break, by the way. <laughs> but um, what, just tell us about later in life. You know, this is uh, just certainly maintains that incredibly appealing smile throughout life. And, uh, and it seems like just a, a really interesting view on, on her own life, as well as the perspective of her community. Any ideas about 80s and 90s? Uh, what she was doing and where she fat, fit in the uh, sort of discourse about Asian American life? She took great care of her parents. Um, you know, that was a real feature of her life. She was maintaining the travel agency and she was always willing to give talks or um, interviews, not huge amounts. Um, there was a kind of backlash against her work at a certain point, you know, as being too compliant, too model minded. Mm -hmm. And I think she, ob obviously, who would be? She wasn't really delighted about that. So I think she became a little more careful about uh, what invitations she accepted. Um, but she, she certainly was um, very much willing to 
engage, I think in particular with uh, Maxine Hong Kingston and mm -hmm. other female writers. Um, my colleague, Leslie Bo, who actually wrote the intro for the new edition mm -hmm. of Fifth Chinese Daughter, um, she talks in that intro about how she actually went when she was a grad student to the travel agency to see her. And Jade Snow Wong was so salty with her at first. That right? Just like, oh, you young people, what do you want? Like, what, what kind of negative things are you trying to write about me? No, uh, no. But then she warmed up a little bit. Um, so when she passed in 2006, uh, was she commemorated when she passed? Did, uh, was there a general, uh, you know, in, in the Chinese American community, but also broadly uh, appreciated for her contributions? in passing she was certainly it was certainly noted you know she was certainly um it was widely reported in obituaries um i think that the san francisco community in particular was extremely aware mm -hmm. um nationally i don't know how much attention mm -hmm. she received at that point um, the real but, would you say it's fair to say that the, her most famous time was with the production of the book in 1950s, and that's when she had the most notoriety uh, yes, among the broader I, I American, so. broader American. Yeah, I think so. Because because she was really seen. You know, whether or not she was, we could debate. But she was really portrayed in the media as being very singular at that time, mm -hmm. and so I think that um, that was a moment where her her story was of such interest to people yeah very interesting well thank you for introducing us to uh to jade snow wong and uh, and i'm sure several of our uh more uh informed and educated participants maybe you already know uh, jade snow wong and know the book i certainly am going to be looking it up and and trying to find out more i do want to invite anyone who has questions for uh dr kim uh, or comments. I know Abby has a comment here from us. Are you aware, are either of you aware that Mills College is closing? Were you aware of that, Heidi? I wasn't. I knew that they were in difficulties, but I didn't know that they had, that, that they had taken the decision to close. But did, was Mills College was a women's college, but did it ever go co-educational or was it a women's college throughout its, uh, I don't think it did. If it did, it was very, very late. Okay. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a shame. Uh, by the way, this has just been a, a you know, just a catastrophe uh, across uh, the higher education, even before COVID with the mm -hmm. cutting of humanities departments and the closing of, of small institutions. And please, uh, if anyone is aware of, thank you, Paul, put an article oh, thanks, Paul. About, uh, about Mills College. Uh, I'm going to click on it myself so I can read it after this. <laughs> <laughs> support your support your institutions of higher learning. Like I mentioned, thank you everyone who gave to uh, Carolina Public Humanities during Give UNC. But you know, we just need as much help as we can get across the board in higher education. It's really just a, a tremendous catastrophe, especially with humanities departments and humanities disciplines being targeted with closures. My own my own uh, alma mater of University of Vermont is is shuttering whole departments and uh, releasing faculty right now. And of course, only in humanities. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come up, do we have, uh, uh, it, uh, Abby knows it remained all women. Thank you, Abby, for that. Uh, Abby is on top of Mills College. We appreciate that. Uh, you know, if, if people don't have questions, I have another question for you. And that is to just kind of, again, go back to where we, we might've begun and to, of course, I'm going to I'm going to, uh, let me make sure I have the right screen. There we go. I'm going to, do you see your book? You should, <laughs> there it is, good. Um, we're sort of going back to where we began here. Where, uh, what, how does, how does Jade Snow Wong fit into your overall, uh, you know, illegal immigrants, model minorities? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> She's a really big part of the book, actually, because she was really this proto model minority. And she really tried to conceal the history of, you know, illegal or fraudulent, as it was more often called than immigration in her family, in ways that I think give us a lot of insight into the pressures behind that model minority image. So that people um, the co entire communities, but certainly individuals were really living with this pressure. 
um, from the government, again, compounded by fears of some kind of communist infiltration. And so uh, I should say wildly exaggerated fears. And so they have this kind of, um, this kind of defense mechanism essentially that kicks in, right? As always, right? To be exemplary, to be 200% as good as the white student next to them, right? That the only way to protect themselves was by being, you know, academically um, or kind of in their social conduct as perfect as possible. So I, I really set out to kind of trace those tensions in her work, um, in others' work of this era, um, to also look at the authors who departed from that, right? Mm -hmm. And how they were received publicly, usually not as well, right? Mm -hmm. The model minority image was popular and powerful. Um, but then also to see how the dialogue changes in the 1970s with the Asian American movement and with immigration reform also, so that there's a greater understanding of those restrictions and uh, a bigger willingness to speak out about the racist basis for so many of those restrictions. Does this mind the model minority? I know there have been um, controversies or, or, you know, I call them complaints about affirmative action um, and, and Asian Americans. Um, and again, that the stereotype is that Asian Americans are, do not need a hand up because they're all model minorities and taking classical lessons and are really good at math, you know, like this sort mm -hmm. of thing that sort of, can you speak to that? Um, and, and where we should, uh, understand Asian Americans as people and not as just sort of a, a general group that are the model minority, how is this still affecting us in things like college admissions and whatnot? Yeah, we actually, the Asian American Center had a really interesting talk um, from Professor Iko Day in the fall that was specifically about college admissions. I think that the, the thing to remember with the model minority myth is that, first of all, it's been partly manufactured, mm -hmm. again, by immigration policy, right, where people in certain favored professions were given priority even after the 1965 mm -hmm. immigration reforms. So you kind of construct the community that you want in a, in a sense when immigration is so heavily restricted. But also that, you know, that's not 100% the case. And the model minority image really hides that diversity among Asian Americans. And it results in so many Asian Americans not getting the help that they need hmm. because we have so much diversity in the community, right? We have refugees, we have H-1B visas, right? We have student visas, we have, you know, people who come in um, just sort of, you know, there, there is no regular way to immigrate yeah. anymore. So um, what we really see is that this, this perception that they're all doing fine, right? It, it leads to people not getting the help they need. But likewise, there's always a flip side of it, which is that, well, they're a model minority, but they lack creativity or they lack leadership ability, or you know, they, they lack a kind of um, ability to integrate into a non-Asian workforce or whatever it might be. So it's, it seems, you know, I, I feel like many times um, people look at it and they're like, well, but, but it's a positive stereotype. Right, yeah. but it's it's only positive about a millimeter deep. Well, and stereotypes prevent us from seeing people as people and understanding the diversity of even individual experience. Right, you know that yeah. everybody is, is has all sorts of different ways of engaging with the world, and we should really listen uh, and uh, and try to appreciate and not rely on stereotypes. Heidi, Dr. Kim, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, I want to say this will live on on YouTube. Um, so uh, so we'll uh, have opportunities for, we, we don't put comments on because you know YouTube uh, uh, at any rate. And I just also want to just uh, give you more uh, words of solidarity um, and that, um, you know, all of us, uh, all of us in Americans are affected when any 
American is affected uh, or any person in the world is affected by uh, injustice, racism, and violence. So uh, really um, solidarity with the Asian American community uh, and with all who are facing that right now. Thank so, you, Max. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for introducing us to Jade Snow Wong. What a fascinating person. Um, and uh, we look forward to learning more from you, Heidi. Thanks. I'll come right. back anytime. All right. Thanks so much. We'll talk soon. Bye bye, everybody. Uh, next Friday, we're back on our Friday schedule. So uh, join us with Philip Gurra and William Apis. And uh, we'll be, uh, of course, go to humanities.unc.edu, Facebook, all of that good stuff. And go and follow us on YouTube. We have our channel there. And that's where you can catch all of the last friends, uh, lunch with friends and strangers and other great events that we put on at Carolina Public Humanities. Everybody, uh, tomorrow and the next day are wellness days. Take advantage of them, get well, and uh, we'll be returning us uh, soon enough. Thank you everyone for joining us today. One more time, thank you, uh, Dr. Heidi Kim. It's been wonderful. My pleasure. Awesome, bye-bye everybody, thank you.